Hello, welcome to our panel. Today we will discuss a very important and an actual issue, Libya. There is an ongoing political process over there after a strict fight uh, right after the attack of Khalifa Haftar after uh, April 4th of 2019. Many things happened. Uh, and now we will discuss exactly what opportunities we have or what challenges we may face right after the start of this political process. And today we have really uh, distinguished guests. I want to first introduce you, uh, our guests. Uh, the first one is Mr. Salahattin El Namruj, former Minister of Defense in Government of the National Accord of the Libya, uh, Libya State. Uh, the second guest is Dr. Mustafa El Sagazli, he is the general manager of the Libyan program for the reintegration and development. And finally, we have uh, another distinguished and very young and experienced guest, Emadatin Badi. Uh, he is the senior fellow at Atlantic Council and also senior analyst at Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. So we have more or less security oriented guests in this panel, though we will discuss not only security, but the political process, what happened and what can happen in the near future. Uh, you know, Libyan issue is really complicated. The revolution was in 2011 and now 10 years passed, a decade has passed. And if you just compare the initial purpose of the revolution and the obtained outcome as of now, there are some failures and also many developments that could not be foreseen. But if you go through the failures, I think we should go through first, first of all, the reasons, dynamics, actors, actual developments on the ground, expectations of the public, and also, uh, you know, internal dynamics of Libya. Right after the revolution, there are two main challenges uh, for the uh, Libyan public, it was first 2014 and 15 events, and later than 2019 attacks of Khalifa Haftar. On the other hand, if you go through the flows, we should first focus on the systemic flows because individual ones are a bit an outcome of this systemic structure. And also international community does have responsibility and lack of interest up until this year, and it has been a you know, a type of input in Libyan issue. On the other hand, we can't forget the inherited structure from the Qaddafi regime that made us uh, very committed to Libyan crisis because uh, as international community, we could do nothing. And also, Haftar's attack is a clear violation of internal law in, Tur in Libyan, uh, Libyan state, and also an, in international law, because Haftar is a general of Libyan state, and now it, uh, we are facing a coup d'etat attempt of Haftar. Unfortunately, uh, actually fortunately, uh, Haftar retreated from the south of Tripoli. Now there's a culmination point in uh, Libya in terms of military, and the UN is led political process is our hands. On the other hand, if you take Haftar, the attitude of the external actors, I think this was a type of war of legitimacy and illegitimacy. So in this uh, panel, we will discuss the current situation in terms of political process and also what opportunities we have in the coming period. So I want to first invite uh, the youngest participant of this panel, Mr. Imadat Dimbadi. Uh, he is uh, representing for me the young generation of Libyan public. And his views are completely independent because uh, as I perceive, you know, follow your tweets, follow your messages in social media, uh, you are very objective in terms of assessing the situation in Libya. So for you, uh, if you take Libya, uh, 
what is the situation like uh, in uh, right now what is the expectation of public what opportunities we have to respond the expectations of the public and what risks in the coming period mainly if political process fails thank you the floor is yours okay uh, i'll try and stick to a 30000 foot view uh, of things just because as you said it's quite complicated and, and very much challenging uh as a young libyan i kind of witnessed the revolution unfold uh when i was 18 i believe and now 29 and having witnessed everything got fam familiarized with the institutional architecture of the gaddafi era and the post gaddafi era uh, you can argue that the ironic thing is that we still have a lot of the contours of gaddafi state in today's libya uh, at the institutionally speaking at least and uh, in addition the other ironic facet is i believe had you told a lot of those that revolted in 2011 that you'd end up 10 a decade later with a uh, government of national unity with the current figures uh, that are part of it perhaps you might not have had a revolution or they wouldn't have believed you but in any case uh, i think we've overall kept the institutional architecture of the gaddafi of the gaddafi system and the economic uh, and his economic, really, architecture and the way he managed to mold patronage and use that as a way to co-opt, uh, incentivize, or coerce certain factions. Now, with the government of national unity, it seems that that strategy is being fully embraced, again, as a tool for governance. Uh, you can clearly see that in the Beba's approach to um, dealing not just with international actors, but also with domestic actors. Uh, and I think where this slightly departs uh, from what the government of national court was doing, which also somewhat used the, the same strategy, is that uh, what he has tried to do is essentially establish patronage for all the factions, but establish also a network through which he would oversee that. So, uh, and for instance, in the case of Khalifa Haftar, which you mentioned in your introductory remarks, he's not used to that. He's not used to his patronage being tied to a government. He's not used to his uh, ability to access funds to be overseen by another ent entity or another individual, whichever whichever one, you're, whichever your reading leads you to. Uh, but I think that's what the Beba's approach has been in terms of uh, not completely sidelining Haftar, not completely uh, de jettisoning his access to state funds, but at the same time, not falling in the same trap as the government of national court in terms of actually just allocating a lump sum uh, to the Libyan Arab Armed Forces, to uh, Khalifa Haftar, and also allowing him to access revenues in different ways, uh, illicit and illicit. Now, you can also argue that this isn't just Beba's own uh, cunningness or, or uh, at work, basically, uh, there are other factors at play, namely the fact that Khalifa Haftar's offensive has failed, uh, and that also means that locally dissent is far more widespread than it was pre-offensive. Uh, so you have a lot more uh, factions um, that are more amenable to dealing with the government of national unity. You haven't seen the same degree of, uh, for instance, dissent that existed in 2016 when the government of national court uh, came into place because that government was heavily contested right at inception. This time it seems that a mix of conflict fatigue, a mix of scarcity in resources, a mix of also uh, lack of lack of belief in the military option, at least in the short term, is causing a lot of the factions to, for now, uh, entertain uh, this government entertained the idea of elections in December of 20, uh, 2021, which is the prospected date for elections at this stage, and uh, basically play ball <laughs> with the Beba, I would say. Um, but where there are, there are clear challenges is really at the level of, first of all, the fallouts uh, of what happened since 2011 onwards. So you have systemic issues like corruption, uh, like governance, uh, like services, basically. And you also have a lot more problems that came as a, almost a direct or indirect result 
of the offensive uh, on Tripoli and a lot of also the wars that we've been through between 2011 and two, 2021. So one, for instance, the most prominent one for me at least is uh, socially speaking. Uh, the Libyan landscape is completely different to what it was in 2009 or 2011, even 2014, 17. Uh, with the wars in Baghazi and, and Tripoli and Anderna, uh, for instance, if you want to consider those really the, the most overt forms of, of wars that we had. Uh, now, the conflict has really touched on everyone. I think there's no one in Libya that has been insulated from any patterns of the conflict. We all have a, I don't want to say a relative, but we all have a at least an acquaintance, if not a friend, that has been severely affected by uh, the war, particularly by the war on Tripoli, because that involved a lot of uh, a lot of members of the society, particularly also since uh, Haftar had displaced a lot of residents from eastern Libya towards western Libya and attacking Tripoli again for a lot of people. It was a pattern of deja vu, at least for those that were in eastern Libya uh, and that were displaced. They did, a lot of them knew this was potentially what Haftar wanted, really uh, a power grab. But uh, in any case, aside those kind of social issues, which aren't being dealt with in almost any way by the political process, aside having a very small reconciliation kind of framework uh, by the presidency council, uh, you also have most very glaring issues at the level of security. Uh, the issue of security has been relegated almost to the background, uh, the issue of also military unification, something which led to the rise on the one hand of Khalifa Haftar and on the other hand, uh, particularly I would say, partly I would say at least in Western Libya has really entrenched a form of hybridity that uh, is counterproductive in terms of the provision of human security, but also counter counterproductive in terms of establishing state oversight over security structures. Uh, that has been relegated to the background. Uh, the new government of national unity is having a very hands-off approach to the entire security file, which is problematic to say the least, because you are planning elections. Therefore, you need the level, an acceptable level of security to uh, not just conduct those, but also for people to be able to freely cast their vote. Uh, and you can imagine that in a semi a hybrid authoritarian setting like Eastern Libya's or one where a lot of local groups uh, will probably coerce uh, also local communities in Western Libya, something which happened in several municip municipal elections, for instance, that might be a problem at some point. Now, aside the electoral problem, security is also an important, uh, an important file regardless, because it's affecting a lot of other uh, other issues, uh, notably transnational organized crime, human smuggling, drug trafficking, et cetera, et cetera. And all those patterns of revenue generation uh, because of the scarcity of funds right now. Libya is a rentier state. It has a lot of funds, but not everyone is able to access them equally. So a lot of groups, uh, some of which are marginalized, some of which are more opportunistic or criminal, have gone for uh, illicit revenue schemes. And you clearly see that right now uh, that trend is picking up as well and the lack of focus on kind of security or a minimal focus on that file will basically continue uh, continue that uh that track the other i would say the last perhaps so i mentioned i don't know how much time i have is the economic uh file and on the economic file that has also come to a grinding halt whether it be at the level of the uh budget endorsement by the house of representatives which hasn't really passed uh, the budget not, not wanting to give the the government of national unity an opportunity to even assert itself uh, and govern the entirety of libya uh, but merely want but they don't mind actually passing the salaries clause and paying themselves <laughs> for the most part so you clearly see that the political kind of um alignment that happened at the Libyan Political Dialogue Forum and subsequently at the endorsement ceremony of the uh, House of Representatives was uh, short-lived, uh, if it ever existed, uh, because it was more, for me at least, a symptom of opportunism than it was anything else. And that opportunism will continue. And that is the threat, uh, I would say, to the LPDF roadmap, because the LPDF wasn't envisioned as a, an agreement in a forum. It was envisioned as this post 
conflict transition plan that would culminate into elections. So you can't say that the LPDF was a success purely because 75 people agreed on a list and a government was appointed. You can only say that the LPDF is a success after elections are held at the date of a free free, fair and meaningful elections are held on the date where they were set on December 24th. And right now, most of those signs that we have point to the fact that that will not happen. Either uh, they won't be free, fair and meaningful, or they won't be held um, at the time or the calendar the set date that they were uh, prospected to be held in. And either of do, those two options can lead us to relapse into conflict, whether it's a local conflict initiated by local conflict actors that would not want to see uh, themselves sidelined for a protracted period of time from governance or uh, factions that would actually contest the result of elections owing to the con very conditions unfair, I would say, that they were held in. And uh, the lack of focus on the conditions, so actual conflict resolution rather than conflict management, uh, which would lead us to good, good kind of electoral conditions, uh, that is offering an ammunition, essentially, putting a bullet uh, in the brain of a very, very uh, fledgling, I would say, democratic transition process. So um, I'll leave it at that, and maybe we can tackle more in the q and I tried to stick to a 30,000 kind of full view uh, of things and not, not fall for too much negativity. But uh, yeah, let's, let's see what the discussion brings about. Curious to see what the other participants will say. OK, thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, good points, because uh, when we had started the project on security sector reformation, uh, along with Mr. Mustafa Sakazli, uh, the common issue that was uh, delineated by the, you know, interviewed Libyans uh, was about institutionalization of the state. That forefronts your, uh, you know, sentiments, because if you don't have, a, have an institutionalization at the state level, that means you are dealing with threats like organized crime, for instance, uh, pending to your expertise, and also, you know, uh, different power vacuums in the country, pending to uh, cities or regions or tribal structures, uh, east, west, south, it's a generalized regionalization of Libya that I don't agree because uh, each country, uh, each region, each uh, city does have a different structure. Uh, that means institutionalization at state level is important. And for this issue, that's what I believe, political process should be complemented with uh, security sector. And I would like to hand over the session to Mustafa Sakazla, because uh, he is leading an NGO directly dealing with uh, DDR. He had a perfect publication on this issue. So I would like to ask, uh, if you take DDR process that is desired in the minds, uh, if you take the security sector or take political process, and also, you know, uh, for instance, there is a question I see, and uh, let me add it. Uh, how do you assess the ceremony held by uh, Haftar in Benghazi? The question asks. It's a good question, I believe, because in this ceremony, we saw many uh, tanks, armored vehicles, aircrafts, uh, missiles, uh, UAVs, armed UAVs. And uh, they were in an order like a regular armed forces. That means political process is at risk, actually. So how do you compare and contrast uh, the security structure, uh, you know, political process, and afterwards? A very uh, hard question, you. I know. <laughs> thank you, uh, Professor Murad. And uh, I'm happy to be uh, back. Uh, on uh, CETA's webinars with uh, Dr. Salah Namrush and uh, also my dear friend uh, Imad Badi. Uh, I will start with uh, a saying, a statement by Musmari in the last couple of days where he said, war hasn't ended. It has been halted to give a chance to the political dialogue. So it is clear uh, that Haftar uh, his project is still on the table. Uh, he's giving time to the political dialogue. If the political dialogue allowed him to control Libya, 
he will give it more time and he will support it. Else, as we have seen, his arms are ready, his tanks are ready, uh, his mercenaries are ready to try again to take over the whole country. I think uh, the main uh, issue and the main challenge in front of uh, uh, Libyans, all of us, is that we have not uh, uh, started looking into uh, state building, uh, security sector reform, rebuilding our institutions, DDR, demobilizing, uh, disarming, reintegrating militias all, all over Libya. Our political uh, dialogue since uh, Sahirat and uh, LPDF, the 75 members, has been uh, on political issues, on uh, the division of power between uh, political conflicting parties. It has uh, state building or security sector reform or institution building or even peace building has not been uh, the main pillar of uh, these uh, dialogues. For example, when we uh, uh, go through what happened with the LPDF, for example, how, it, how Anzmil selected these 75 people, on which basis? Uh, nobody knows. Uh, even during the process, uh, this political process that is supposed to bring uh, a new government and uh, go to uh, elections on the 24th of December, it is clear that uh, even during the, pro uh, the process, there were uh, huge issues and challenges. For example, we all have heard that uh, there were bribes, briberies, and it was confirmed by, by reports. Uh, the selection of the 75, uh, many Libyans don't believe that these 75 people represent them, even though uh, Anzmil has selected them on an ad hoc basis. So this is one of the uh, main challenges, challenges. Who is, uh, who is able or who is legitimate to represent the Libyan people? Also, uh, on the political process, we can see that Anzmil, uh, since 2014, Sahirat and Berlin, Italy, Rome, Paris, and so on, has neglected uh, the constitution that we have a constitution that has been drafted. We have, we had a committee that constitutional committee, six of 60 members that had been elected by the Libyan people. The constitution draft is there. Why, uh, why didn't Anzmil or uh, the political process give the Libyan people a chance to uh, vote uh, on the constitution? Uh, there should, according to uh, the constitutional uh, roadmap that was drafted uh, by the NTC. This committee is to uh, to draft the constitution and then a referendum is to be held. This referendum has not been held and it's clear uh, throughout the political process under Anzmil that it has been neglected. There is a question, has it been neglected in purpose and why? Uh, this is a big question today in, uh, in Libya. Uh, many people would like to uh, practice their right to say yes or no to uh, this con constitution. Uh, and it is really strange that instead of uh, allowing the Libyan people to uh, cast the votes on yes or no on the constitution, uh, Anzmil is giving the right to a small committee that has not been uh, elected uh, part of the 75 LPDF to draft a new, uh, they call it constitutional basis for the coming phase and coming period and the coming election. So uh, also this is a big question. Why? Why do we have to enter into another transitional phase? And why do we have to uh, abide by a smaller group of people that has been selected by uh, Anzmil to uh, neglect the constitution, give them the right to draft a new uh, constitutional basis, they call it. So these are our challenges. They start, in my opinion, they start from the point that there is no uh, vision or there is no uh, state building, uh, security sector reform, DDR, 
uh, institution building approach and peace building approach. Uh, we have entered into these political conflicts without looking at the holistic picture that Libya is a failed state. Libya needs to be uh, rebuilt. Rebuil state building starts with conflict resolution, peace building, institution building, and then uh, development. Instead of that, Anzmil and our political elite has uh, driven us into these transitional periods and these, transi uh, these uh, political uh, conflicts. Uh, now there is a call, a strong call in Libya, actually uh, two days ago, uh, uh, more than 50 members of parliament and also a large number, a larger number of uh, uh, H HOR, 50 HOR members, 50 or 56, and a larger number from the state council have uh, uh, issued statements calling for uh, uh, approving the constitution, the draft, uh, drafted constitution for uh, a one period uh, parliamentary period. So one term of the parliament of four years, according to, according to the constitution, as a transitional period, instead of drafting a new constitutional basis as Ansmil wants. And this might be uh, a better approach since uh, if we run into new elections, presidential elections, parliamentary elections, we would need to have some uh, controls on the new president and the new parliament. Else, we might have someone like uh, Khalifa Hefter or uh, another uh, dictator that would elect himself for the presidency and then uh, because of his control of 70% of, of, of Libya would uh, win the elections or uh, maybe even uh, uh, force his, his uh, winning of the elections and then we will, he will have the legitimacy as an elected president and then we will enter into another phase of dictatorship. We had 42 years, we don't know this time how long uh, it will take to get rid of it. So these are the, the real challenges that are facing the uh, political uh, discussions in Libya and the political process. But in my opinion, uh, the main issue is that uh, the political process has not taken into perspective. Uh, its approach is not an approach of solving the real issues of security sector reform. Uh, how to deal with the current uh, militias, uh, current armies in the east and in the west, uh, how to rebuild the institutions, including the governmental institutions, which are quite corrupt, uh, and also the uh, economy. Uh, so uh, not tackling the issues of conflict resolution, peace building, state build building and institutional Hello. I think there's a problem with the connection with uh, Mustafa Bey. Yes. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, now we can hear you. Yes, we lost you for okay. a while. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So these are the main, the approach, it, the approach itself does not allow for uh, the political process to succeed since it is not based on uh, the right assessment of the current situation of Libya. Libya is a fragile state, a failed state. Uh, the first uh, issues that must be tackled are the security issue, the reconciliation issue, the state, the institution building issue, public administration reform. As we can see, these issues have not been uh, deeply discussed during uh, the polit political process. This is why in my opinion, the political process will fail this time as it has failed uh, in Sahirat and uh, the, the last few years. So uh, these are, this is my opinion when it comes to the political process and where it will lead us. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Sakızdı. Uh, you know, you touched really an important issue, it's state building. Mostly we see little pictures in a crisis, but uh, not deal with the overall uh, composition of the problem. 
leading us to a comprehensive solution to the overall process or not only the conflict but there are some social political economic you know judiciary problems that should be addressed uh, in a crisis so state building in my opinion covers the all of these uh, issue fields in question on the other hand uh, you touched suheirat for instance i think the main challenge for the suheirat is the libyan political dialogue forum because the decisions they have uh, are binding all parties in libya so if you uh, you know uh, if you just review the validity of the suheirat agreement and also the presence of the current uh, forum's uh, authority uh, it seems that there is a kind of competition of both process the previous one and the uh, current one on the other hand there are some questions coming from the uh, you know uh, audience uh, ansmil is an interesting issue because ansmil uh, for me, should assume responsibility not only to manage the crisis and uh, take it to uh, an accept acceptable, uh, you know, course for a resolute, uh, you know, uh, con concluding, uh, how do you say, uh, situation. Uh, but here, still people are questioning that. So that's the issue. Uh, well, it's a success. I would like to appreciate the efforts of Stefani Turco Williams because it's really a success to have all parties sit and talk. Even though some, uh, you know, uh, decisions taken uh, cannot satisfy some parties in Libya, at the end of the day, they are still a decision, and it's you know uh, better to have at least the worst decision to be implemented on the ground. On the other hand, they also create challenges. So, uh, in your terms, in this holistic picture, I think we should also visit the perspective of His Excellency uh, Salatin Namrush, doc Dr. Salatin Namrush. Because, uh, sir, welcome again. You are the one Thank you. who managed all the crises in terms of responding Haftar's attack uh, right after April 4th. And also, you are the one who posed a decisive determined uh, a strong stance against uh, attacks because think that up until the uh, you know presence of turkish troops uh, with you you were alone over there and yes. haftar was enjoying the support of many states not only one or two but many states so if you take this process the conflict process and also uh, you are currently in a position to observe the political process and also look forward if uh, elections on December 24th will be, you know, achieved or not. And success or failure of this election is a point of concern. If it fails, uh, not I'm not, you know, uh, pointing out the short you know, short-term delays, but if it fails, then Haftar says, I'm ready. Uh, he showed the troops in Benghazi. If it succeeds, there is no guarantee that Russia and Haftar will tolerate it or not. So how do you see the picture? Right after this long military conflict, uh, after the revolution, and also the political process, and afterwards. The floor is yours, sir. Okay, thank you, Mr. Murad, and uh, Assalamu alaikum, dear brothers. Uh, regarding, as you said, after this long war and attack of Haftar forces to Tripoli, and what we will see about the election. As my brother Ahmed said, the only way uh, result that we get from the political process was the 24th of December as an election. But this uh, depends on the result of election. As uh, one of the guys said, it's maybe Haftar can manipulate or can force 70% uh, of the country maybe to vote for himself. So the other party or us, we will not be uh, happy with these results and maybe it will lead to another conflict. But we should go back again. Uh, before the 4th of April, uh, the international community and the United Nations, uh, they said it should be, uh, uh, I mean, a conference gathering all the Libyan parties to solve all the issue and then we find out that the uh, 4th of April, uh, 
uh, aggression led by Haftar and his militias uh, towards Tripoli to destroy what all the international community have did before and all the efforts that may lead to to peace in Libya or a good a good solution. So we believe while Haftar still uh, exists and is even as his uh, latest uh, show in Benghazi and the way he deal with the government of uh, national unity and the way even the government responds to him we we can see it's maybe we'll go back again to uh, another uh, conflict here in Tripoli or somewhere else not not far uh, kind of unif unification the the security or the the military or other organization in Libya I don't think so it will be easily happen while we, we still some 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 guys in in, in the picture so uh, the political process was maybe success. We have ceasefire. It's good for both parties. It's good for the most of the Libyans. But for how long this one will stay? It's a permanent or just, I mean, uh, a quick solution. It will not last for long, as we see from Skherat. Then we go back now to Geneva talks. We still doing the same thing, and we don't know what, what will happen next. Uh, country still not stable. After still challenging the international community, uh, he don't uh, care what will happen. The guy just uh, and uh, the the external uh, supporters for Haftar they still don't show any good respect. Uh, they still supporting him as uh, you you said uh, regarding the show in Benghazi. Uh, all kind of tanks, armored vehicles, uh, military systems. The guy even he don't care that uh, he was under embargo, and uh, you can see uh, what 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 equipment he, he got and how he how he get it uh, for uh, our party here in, in Tripoli. Uh, maybe just as you said, we asked for five countries last time to to stand with the legitimate uh, government, the government of national accord at that time. But uh, Turkey just the only country you respond to us. Thanks to our Turkish brother for that. But now what we can see, uh, most of the country against uh, Turkish and why Turkish responding interfere in Libya in that way. They don't look to other part. So the situation really what we can see, even what we, we are expecting from the uh, second Berlin talks, everybody now focusing of uh, how we uh, clear out all mercenaries from the country. And this is really our opinion. Everybody should go back. Uh, they're talking about the foreign forces. There is big difference between the forces we have, the help we get from Turkey. It was uh, uh, acquired by the, the government of national accord in front of the United Nations in a legal way. It's not uh, that we hired some mercenary companies or black uh, uh, company, black uh, companies that deal with, with the mercenaries. Now, really, we are we we are uh, how to say tired of this uh, double standard uh, of the international community uh, they don't look really uh, to libya and they don't just maybe they are standing with one side uh, there is no real interfere from the countries to 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 help libyan to solve their uh, their blue room or to stand against uh, what haftar did of the international crimes what we can see in we found in Tarhuna in the south of Tripoli, everybody neglecting that. And now we have the criminal as a part with us in this uh, future uh, uh, plan to, to solve the, the Libyan problem. Really, while this we don't uh, all the time, last time we asking uh, the international community and the international, uh, uh, international court uh, to look at the crime, the the war crime, uh, war crime did by uh, Haftar and his forces, and to take it in account. But nobody cares. Just now, Haftar is still as a part. Nobody talk about what he did. So I think, as you said, we are going back again to the to the square one. We as 24th of December, if the election happen, uh, the results we don't know how how the results gonna be. Uh, maybe. It will be a conflict between the parties. If the election is not happening into 24th of December, it will be another case. And uh, after he will, he is preparing himself. He prepare his troops. He is ready for another war with his supporters. Uh, 
So that's all what I can see now. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Then election seems decisive in identifying the stability of Libya in the coming year. This is what I understood from your sentiments. And uh, if fails, uh, I think we should expect another conflict. On the other hand, uh, neglectance is really uh, one issue that should be reminded to international community because Uh, we are talking about international politics. That means the politics among not the nations, but actually the states. The government, uh, you know, uh, the GNA uh, was exactly the legitimate party in Libya and actually called support, requested support from the community and you were alone. So I think we should not forget this. And second thing, the double standards that you have delineated are really important. For instance, I drafted an article regarding Operation Irvine. Yes. Uh, well, people reacted in Europe to me. People reacted because the common sense in European mind is that the Operation Irvine is to implement the embargo on Libya. Well. Uh, if you do so, Haftar should not have weapons, equipment, or mercenaries at the eastern portion of Libya because most of them are brand new, brought from other countries. I don't know where. Uh, actually, we know, but uh, we must have proof. So I think this double standards and, uh, you know, neglectance is a clear proof of still lacking commitment to political process. This is what I believe. True. Uh, I would like to thank you all. I would, uh, and now I want to go to the questions. Uh, we have some questions that I have already pointed. Uh, the first question uh, is about the ceremony held by the Haftar. We have touched this issue. And the second question is more relevant to Imad. Uh, it says, do you think that organized crime is a risk for the political process? Uh, he or she asks, what do you think? Well, obviously, I mean, the organized crime comes in different shapes and forms and has uh, different also aims. Uh, as I said, you could argue that part of the LAF's funding, for instance, came from uh, organized criminal activities, uh, whether they be uh, financial criminal activities or financial fraud. Some people would say that, for instance, accruing the amount of debt that they accrued over time, I believe the figure is around 30 billion or so, um, is a form of financial crime that is now complicating not just the political process, but even the economic process and the uh, unification of the central bank. And then you have other forms of uh, transnational organized crime like smuggling, uh, human trafficking, drug smuggling, etc. Uh, some groups are doing that, I will say. They are a criminal group, but some are doing doing this more out of necessity uh, and owing in part at least to the centralization of the state and that they don't have opportunities where they are locally uh, and other groups are more geared towards uh, criminal activities and using these funds then for uh, war efforts which is what the LAF did the LAF is involved in human trafficking is involved in uh, drug uh, drug trafficking as well and some of the groups in uh, western Libya are equally Uh, guilty of that, but I would say that the structure overall in Western Libya is far more decentralized than it is centralized like the LAFs is where things are revolved around Haftar, around Saddam, around Khalid, etc, etc. So that that dynamic is problematic because automatically what this does is it indirectly uh, puts into jeopardy the entire political process because if parties have the funds and economic means to uh, self-sustain and stay first of all in power and then also launch a war effort in order to contest the electoral results then that is a problematic dynamic and that also impedes on other parts of the political process like i mentioned so for instance they won't have an incentive for security sector reform because part of the incentives for that are economic in in nature uh, you need to 
have incentives, economic ones, to integrate fighters, etc. And if they see that they have other resources that they can, better resources that they can access uh, without falling under the state, well, they might go for that. And then the other facet is, as I mentioned, more macro institutional, like the central bank, etc. So those are all issues that put into jeopardy the political process. And that's part of the reason why we need to tackle these. But I will say that the threat is more indirect than it is uh, direct. So it's, the, the links are <laughs> a bit more indirect than they are direct. I'll leave that down. OK. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, I told you just before this uh, panel, I was responsible for countering organized crime in Balkans and Afghanistan when I was a colonel. Uh, you know, under NATO mission is really one of the hardest issue because each conflict becomes an economy after a while, and yeah. when it uh, when it reflects itself to a color on a money print, that means it's truly really hard to you know uh, have the groups diminish by themselves. But you should resist. Uh, so very hard thing you know to achieve. Uh, and Absolutely. especially if you th go through the different varieties of the, you know, organized crime gangs dealing with different brands of crimes, uh, it's very hard. For instance, let me give you an example for that. Afghanistan was uh, really interesting in terms of organized crime in 2005 because we were witnessing the kidnapping of uh, small kids from the streets uh, for the, you know, uh, or, uh, how do you say, uh, plantation Ransom. of organs? Yes. Oh, yes. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That means that means yes. It is an issue to be faced maybe in Libya if conflict continues after the elections. So uh, I think Libyans should be vigilant for that. Another question is more about international politics and affiliation with the Libyan crisis, because the question says is Europe well hearted to promote stability in Libya because they have supported Haftar and now in touch with the GNU. And another question uh, that I see is about the USA affiliation with the ONS mill through Stephanie, Stephanie Turco Williams. Uh, and the question says, is this a point of political and military Russian presence in Libya, even during the political process? That means, uh, I think this is my interpretation. Uh, the guest is asking if Russian presence in Libya will continue right after the conflict, even political process is a success. I want to unite both these uh, questions because if, uh, if you take the European case, there's a sharp turning uh, from the policies of the EU and European states in 2014 and 15 and uh, 2019. Uh, for instance, uh, if you go through the statements of the European leaders in 2015, they frankly, openly uh, recognize the legitimacy of the GNA. And they uh, pledge a clear support for, uh, for the established government after Suheirat. On the other hand, right after 2019, the statements says parties of the conflict equating Haftar with the GNA. And they have invited Haftar, for instance, to Palermo and later than Berlin. That means Haftar has become an actor with an equal way with uh, the GNA. So uh, I think this question should go to uh, Mr. Namrush because he is more involved in the politics of them. Do you think that the European policies and the American policy on Libya uh, is consistent? Because you should, you can, you know, compare uh, what they have done during the conflict, what they have done right after the Berlin Conference, because Berlin Conference uh, was an achievement uh, with 55 articles, though it did not stop the conflict on the ground. And now, so if you compare them, how do you see it? I don't think so. The, they have consistent uh, about the, the relationship, as, as you said. But uh, if there is no green light for Haftar, he will not do what he did 
from the European some of the European countries or even the United States, they uh, give a blind eye or they don't see what he is trying to do. They thought maybe he can make it in one week or a few days. He will take over Tripoli and there is one party he will control and they can talk to him. Yes, GNA was a legitimate government and I think it, the meeting was first not in, in Palermo. I think Paris before that, when the Haftar was uh, as a party, they talked to both the GNA and, uh, and Haftar. So, uh, uh, as you mentioned, even the Irini operation, uh, it was uh, operation just to make more tighten to the uh, GNA or the Tripoli side. The blind eye also for the Eastern side, for the Haftar, and we can see that now, after his show of all the equipment he got through that interval of time, why uh, uh, Irini operation was there. So the guy even don't he don't try or he don't care. So if there is a really uh, uh, commitment from the European Union or United States, it was not uh, happen what happened in the fourth of April or after even he will not dare to do any move like that. But as we said, there's a double standard. There is something under the table. Uh, countries, they are saying that uh, really supporting democracy. Uh, they are against the dictatorship. But we know there's a lot of European countries supporting half the United States during uh, uh, Trump. They don't care. They give him the green light to go forward with the support from some European countries, with the intelligence, with the equipment, with even they politically fight with him. So, as we said, if there is uh, unity uh, among the international community, Euro uh, European Union or uh, United States, things will be different today, not, 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 not as we see it now. Okay, so, okay thank you. Uh, and now let's go to the final questions. We have some questions through uh, Twitter directly coming to us and also from YouTube. Uh, the first, actually, they are more or less relevant to uh, military aspects, military organizations or mercenaries. Uh, one of them asks, uh, and also arms groups, uh, do you believe that arms groups will give up the power they have? Do you expect any promising outcome from the Berlin Conference too? This is another issue. And another YouTube question is coming from uh, Ferhat Chan. How realistic is the UN call for foreign mercenaries to leave Libya? And one question from Mati. Uh, what are the main obstacles facing the unification of military institutions in Libya? I think these questions are more relevant to Mr. Saksla. Because... Uh, because if you take the, for instance, last two latest two questions, uh, it's e uh, either about mercenaries and unification of the military institutions that points us security sector reformation along with DDR, as you had mentioned. And the previous one is uh, about the armed groups. Uh, so if you take three of them, I mean armed groups, mercenaries and unification of the military institutions. What do you think about it? Uh, I think when it comes to uh, I think when it comes to armed groups, it is a huge challenge. It's not easy, of course, to uh, integrate and uh, dismantle these uh, armed groups. But if there is a holistic plan that is agreed upon amongst all uh, political uh, leaders uh, and also if there is a plan where these troops some of them would be integrated into the military according to the laws and regulations accepted by the military and the rest who are the majority according to uh, our previous experience in LPRD the majority are interested in having their small businesses continuing their education and so on but you need to have a peace agreement first you need to have uh, the will of the state and the government to uh, implement a DDR program. When it comes to uh, the, the groups themselves on the ground, in my opinion, either in the East or in the West, if it is uh, left to them, they would go for other opportunities if uh, there is a plan and there is a will from uh, the state. You will have some spoilers 
you have to deal with these spoilers according to uh, the political agreement and the peace agreement. When it comes to uh, the issue of uniting uh, the army, I think uh, one of the main issues of uniting the army is to make sure that, in my opinion, in the Libyan case, to make sure that there is one head to the army. So if we uh, agree that the uh, presidential uh, council is the head of the army, then the presidential there, then Hefter should not be heading another army. There should be one chief of staff, there should be one uh, uh, chief uh, uh, of the army, which is the presidential uh, uh, council. Uh, having Hefter on the side will not allow any unification of the army. The man is refusing. Hello. So uh, I think this is a big challenge. While Hefter is there, he will not agree to be uh, under the command of any other uh, commander of chief of the army. Concerning the mercenaries, I think we are in deep tr trouble because we have allowed or Hefter has brought the, the Russians uh, inside Libya. I think the Russians Center also uh, uh, to Chad. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, there were clashes on the border be between uh, Central Africa and, and Chad. Uh, they say that they are also, uh, you know, maybe they have some relations with the new coup d'etat in Mali. So I think the Russians are there to stay. And this is the biggest challenge that Libya will face. And this is, uh, this is really uh, something that we have to think of. Libyans have to unite to make sure that together they get, they have to, they can get rid of these mercenaries, or else we are in in uh, in deep trouble in Libya. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I believe that uh, we are just at the fifty eighth minute of the discussion. Uh, it was really fruitful. I do not know if you have any further recommendation regarding this topic. No? Okay, I thank you a lot. Uh, it was really kind of you to participate this panel. And uh, I believe and also I wish we contributed to the political process in Libya, uh, mainly just delineating the main concerns of the Libyan people. Thank you so much. Thank That you, Professor Morad. Thank you.